Hello, welcome to the Praying Christian Women podcast. I am Alana here with Jamie. How are you? I am doing great. How are you? I'm good. I just realized like my microphone's not even where it's supposed to be. So we're, yeah, we're having a morning, aren't we? <laughs> we're here. We are here. And I, are I'm here. pretty sure that's probably true for a lot of people listening, that they're just like thankful to be here. And that's a good starting point. That is a good starting point. So speaking of starting point, we are starting our episode talking about more of the Proverbs 31 women. The question we've been going through is what can Proverbs 31 teach us about prayer? How does the Proverbs 31 woman pray? And today we are all the way down to verse 20, which is cool. We're making our way through. That's crazy. That really feels like what this is about part six and mm -hmm. like it, but it's just funny. We kind of, it snuck up on me that we got that far <laughs> along because well, we haven't been covering a ton like each time because there's so much to pull out of just a couple of verses. I thought you were going to say, we haven't been covering a ton because like we're just rambling or something. We really haven't said anything. We're six episodes in. We haven't even come to any conclusions about anything no, at all. No, I feel like it's the opposite, actually. I Because when we decided to do this, I was thinking, okay, we have we know the, what these verses say. Are we going to have enough to talk about? And it's been the opposite. It's been, there's so much to talk about. And I think it's a lot like praying through scripture where you're, we're using these verses as a springboard for conversation, mm -hmm. just like you can do that with prayer, where you use scripture as a springboard. It doesn't have to be exactly like word for word dissecting the meaning of each word in the Greek and Hebrew. Mm -hmm. it's, we're just, it, I think there's a lot to glean from it. And I don't know, it's been very fun for me and like a pleasant surprise yeah. to be able to have these, a lot of conversations about each of these verses. Yeah, I really enjoyed it too. Starting in verse 20, today we're going to be talking about, it says she opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. When it snows, she has no fear for her household, for all of them are clothed in scarlet. So for our just for fun, do you want to give us one of your big Alaska snow stories? Alaska snow. I think my funniest Alaska snow story involves our dog and just the oh, yeah? fact that he loves the snow so much. We've had labs before and like I think of our first lab we grew he he was ra born and raised in Virginia mm -hmm. and when it snowed it was like his little paws were these dainty little paws. He would go out there he would like it was like a cat. You know how cats like uh -huh. put Very their paws and gingerly. pull them back real quick. Yeah. Uh -huh. He would do that and eventually he would get into the snow, but every year that it snowed, it was Groundhog Day for him. He was like rediscovering it. This oh, dog, wow. Archie, our current lab, loves the snow. He was born and raised in Alaska and the funniest thing to me, he reminds us of like a polar bear or something like curled mm -hmm. up. Like every time the snow starts to melt, uh -huh. He will curl up on the tiniest little mound of snow left. You know how the snow melts yep. in different patterns and stuff. And it, without fail, every year we would look out and he would be where the last tiny pile of snow was, just curled up on it, like laying on the snow. Aww. <laughs> he he's going to be sad now that you guys have moved. It's funny. He's He used to run from the sun. So in Alaska, mm -hmm. he would always be like when he was outside, he would go under our deck, even if mm -hmm. it was not that hot and it was just sunny, mm -hmm. he'd to be in the deck. But here we have a fenced yard. So before he would be on a line. So it was right. long, but he was if we weren't we seldom was he out there that we weren't out there. But mm -hmm. even when we were out there, he would like go under the deck. But mm -hmm. we can he basically like suns himself now in Huge. the yard. So I don't know what the difference is, if it's a difference in the grass, because it is a different kind of grass that's mm -hmm. less prickly and more soft. So maybe that's part of it, that he it's cool enough in the grass, but he's okay. He seems to be all right, but it does snow here. It's about half of what it is in Anchorage typically. I think okay. Anchorage is 80 some. some inches yeah. is the average. And I think it's like 40 some here. So we do get snow here. So he'll be happy. He made us promise before moving that we would move to a state that still got snow. Did he? That was a conversation he had with you all. Yeah, yeah. He's learning English slowly by slowly. <laughs> How about you? What Do you have a good snow story? 
Silas was born in a snowstorm. And so I went into labor. We were living about a four, three to four hour drive away from the hospital. So we got in the car. It was in the middle of a blizzard, got stuck in construction. So we definitely had that experience. Your story of your dog laying on the snow patches reminds me. So Buttercups are golden doodle. She just turned two. And we got her right around Christmas time. So she did all of her potty training in the winter. And so in the spring, when the snow started to melt, she would go find like the smallest little patch of snow. Cause that's in her mind, that's how she associated it. Mommy wants me to go, mommy wants me to oh pee pee on goodness. the snow. So oh. even when the snow started to melt, she'd, she'd go and find little bitty patches. <laughs> so what happened when it was gone? Did she, was she just distraught? I think she just like, figured it out. Like, I, yeah. I think she, I'm going to do it here. And as long as I don't get in trouble, I guess it's okay. Isn't that funny? She, oh my gosh, that's too so cute. She, yeah, she's a pretty cute little thing. So how about, do you want to pray for our episode? And then we will dive into our discussion. Yes. God, we just thank you for this time to talk about the Proverbs 31 woman. And we just pray, Lord, that you would guide and direct our conversation and just help us to glean from this passage what you want us to take away from it. We just thank you for this example of womanhood, for this celebration of womanhood. And I just pray that each person listening, each woman out there would come away feeling encouraged and prayed over and sung over with rejoicing by you, Lord, that, that she would feel seen and loved and that this would be just an uplifting conversation all around. Amen. Alrighty. Where do you want to start? We can take verse 20. It says she opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. I, the first place my mind goes with this is my own internal struggle with generosity. And mm -hmm. it's not with being generous because I would love to be generous and extend help. I love being generous, especially to people that really need it. Mm -hmm. But my conflict comes from knowing how to do that. And we've talked about this at other times before, but the conundrum of how to be effective and to do help and not harm to people by helping them, to, to know when you're being a good steward or a bad steward of money when helping people, because mm -hmm. there are unfortunately scams and people who are have very bad intentions and I believe God is bigger than all of that and that our generosity for generosity's sake is the goal. And so I really do believe that if I make a mistake and I put my money somewhere that's not going to be used in the way that it was said it would be used, God still blesses that as a sacrifice to him. And he doesn't technically need my money. But I don't know when it, when I'm at, like, we recently moved and I in Alaska had a little bit of a handle on what services were available to people. I had figured out how to give and how to be generous, but here I don't know. And I also, yeah, I don't know when I see someone on the corner and I want to be generous to that person and show them, extend a hand of humanity to them and help them mm -hmm. to feel seen. I, how there's this, like, for instance, the same person on the same corner every day by the grocery store that I go to, how many times do you help that person? Do you tell them about other services that are available? Do you? Yeah. So all of those questions, that's what I tend to wrestle with the most is how do we open our arms to the poor and extend hands to the needy in a way that's responsible, in a way that's loving and not cynical? And how do you stay not cynical when you've been hurt and lied to or burned? Yeah. Wow. You're really 
hitting a lot of heavy ones today. Right? <laughs> You're not making this easy for our conversation. Answer them all right now. <laughs> okay. In a word. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jamie, for that question. I'm going to do the diplomatic. That is a That's very right. good question. Yeah. Next one, please. <laughs> yeah, I think one of the things I would love to touch on more is this idea of dependency in missions, dependency in giving, because there, there are a lot of issues you can take it with like you as an individual seeing an individual on the street corner, or we could take it as we as a national church seeing something going on in this region of the world. And our inclination is I want to go in and I want to do something that will help. And for some people, it just ends there. And so some people will sign the check in order to have that good feeling and to feel like they're doing something. And a lot of times God will absolutely use that generosity to bless the people they're giving, to bless the giver, but there are just some tricky issues that can come up with it. So whether you're talking about, should I give this dollar bill to the person on the street corner when I don't know what they're going to do with it? Or should I make a provision in my will <laughs> for this charity to receive all the money that I've accrued over my lifetime when I die? How do I know what they're going to be doing with it? So I would say, first off, whether you're talking about an individual you want to be generous to or a charity you want to be generous to, is you do need to be asking yourself like, okay, so what's the worst case scenario? The worst case scenario in your case is you hand a couple dollars to the person on the street corner. And as every cynical person knows, some people are just going to use that to buy alcohol or something like that, right? The same thing with charities, right? The most cynical response is they're going to take your money that you sacrificed and toiled and you are truly making this offering to God with it. And they're just going to use it to take their top donors on a cruise <laughs> or something yeah. like that and call that a part of their mission. And I don't have any amazing answers, but I think that we all do need to be asking ourselves that question. And then I think it just turns into asking God to guide your steps because we can't get so cynical that we never help anybody. And that's not what God intends either. And there definitely can become a place when we're in this kind of global economy, we're at this place where we're only, and again, to be very cynical, we're probably like two degrees away from very bad things happening with our money. So by that, I mean, we are paying taxes and the government is using our tax money to fund something that's morally wrong, or I am buying from this company and they are outsourcing to people who are using human slave labor. You know what I mean? In almost any person's, if you were to look at the money coming in and out of the average household's bank account in a given month, we're not far removed from bad people doing bad things with the money that we are using. And then the question becomes, how culpable does that make me? If I'm spending X dollars a month for my smartphone and I know that the batteries that made this smartphone are sourced by people living in deplorable conditions, how complicit am I Am I as guilty mm -hmm. as the person who enslaved Africans a couple hundred years ago? Or am I totally off the hook or am I somewhere in between? And it is, it's really hard. It's really messy. And I have no real good answers other than, yeah, these are questions we should be asking ourselves. Yeah. And there are places where... If you do choose to give to an organization, you can find out what their overhead is. I think everyone mm -hmm. needs to, they have to have reports available publicly. Mm -hmm. There are third parties that you can check into to see things like that. But you're right. There's just, there's, there's so much to consider that you can't possibly 
cover all your bases all the time. Yeah. But being responsible is, and of course, bringing it back home. I think this is where prayer comes into the picture and just prayerfully, I think number one, asking God, where can I put my finances? Where do you want them to go? Is our church Mm -hmm. supporting, already supporting places? Should we up our tithe? Should we look into missions, individuals that we know, that we trust, that are doing hands-on work, that are boots on the ground, places helping people in need? I think just praying and asking God to bring those things to mind and just the, to place on your heart places to donate or give. And the yeah. same goes, I think, for those individual circumstances. What does this person need today? And sometimes it's not money. I Like I said, I feel mm-hmm. like offering eye contact and validating their humanity could probably yeah. go a long way. Absolutely. In or helping water bottles. Someone. Water Mm -hmm. bottles, food, things like that. There was a Mm -hmm. story, speaking of getting burned, that has stuck with me my whole life. I was in high school and we were at the Inner Harbor in Baltimore on a field trip. And I remember we, my friend and I, they let us go wherever we wanted for lunch. And my friend and I went to lunch and I got an extra ham and cheese like meal Mm -hmm. at this little deli place because this woman said, need money for food or something. I don't know what it was, but she had a sign. So I brought the lunch to her and she just had this look of disgust when she opened it and was like I hate him or something like that but it was very Uh ungrateful and it stuck with me it didn't stop me or put me off but it just Mm -hmm. stuck with me as one of those things but what it reminded me of and when I look back now is it is just I think a lot of times when your heart is moved to do something we don't know the impact that gesture has on that person or how God is going to use it at any given time. And it may Mm -hmm. not be in that moment that means something to someone, but maybe it'll be later. Maybe it'll be never. And God just gets that sacrifice of generosity that you're doing just in the name of Jesus. And I think that isn't lost. But I think on the other side, though, as I read this, while you were talking about giving, I initially took this financially But this is talking about opening her arms to the poor, extending her hands to the needy, because there might be some people listening that just think, I, it's hard enough to put food on the table right now. You're asking me to go and give a dollar to a guy on the corner. You're nuts. And this to me is like a spirit of hospitality as Mm -hmm. well, and maybe even more so than the monetary generosity. And I just think you kind of, I almost said you can't go wrong with that, but you can, there can, you can put yourself in dangerous positions by opening Mm. your home, but, but in serving, that's definitely another way to show generosity and use your hands to the needy. I think so much of this comes back to what Jesus said to be shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. Yeah, Because I think about, if you look at it from the hospitality side of it too, then the question becomes, how do you know when it's time to extend your hands to the needy and open your home to the public versus how do you know when to close your doors Mm -hmm. and take care of your family and and be the little mother hen who's got her arms wrapped around her little chicks? (laughs) I think about the very beginning of the pandemic when nobody knew what was going to happen and we were looking over to Italy and we were really scared that the hospitals were going to get overrun and there wasn't any political divisiveness yet about it. And the question truly was like, how are we going to take care of our family? If, Mm -hmm. if we get sick or if the supply chain breaks down, how are we going to make sure like these three kids that God has entrusted to our care are not going to starve And again, that begs the question, okay, so what happens? Scott reads a lot of dystopian or like post-apocalyptic fiction. Mm -hmm. And we've talked before about having basically like a survival story set here in Alaska. Like it might not even need to be as big as like a nuclear meltdown or something, but just like something totally devastating. Alaska is completely cut off. We're not getting food or heating oil or anything like that. And the question becomes like, how much do you circle your own wagons and protect your immediate family versus 
opening your arms to the needy. And again, I think that we need to pray for that discernment to be generous and to be faithful and to trust that God is going to provide. But also I think, and I think there are going to be Christians who disagree with me, but I want to at least propose that there might be a time when taking care of your family's immediate needs does proceed or take precedence over clothing the entire county you live in or something like that, right? If your own child's going barefoot, is it right for you to be mailing shoes overseas? And then, and then that begs the question, should we, and these are such hard questions. And so again, this is my most cynical parrot coming out. This isn't necessarily what I believe, but why are we sending shoe boxes to orphans overseas when foster kids at my child's school aren't getting fed, right? Mm -hmm. Things like that. And so again, I think the church needs to really look because there are stories that are more feel good than others, right? If you had given that ham sandwich to that person and she had cried and said she was so hungry and thank you so much. And she had just been praying and she knew that God was going to provide for her. That's a sweet, heartwarming story. In my opinion, your act of generosity and obedience in God's eyes is the same the way she responded as she did, or if it had been very overflowing and all of this. So there's also a sense of, do you know what? I don't know what's going to happen to this money I'm being generous with or things like that, but I'm doing it for God. Like when we were in ministry, we did feel like people were looking at how we spent our money, right? Yeah. And it was, okay, or we know a lot of missionaries. Okay, here's a hypothetical example that's not really all that hypothetical. You're a missionary couple living overseas. To have the support you raise in a lot of organizations, what it is, you go to people and you ask them to commit to a monthly contribution amount, and you must raise a certain amount before the agency will allow you to go on the field. And that basically turns into your salary. So people are agreeing to give you this much money a month. The agency's sending you a paycheck for this much a month, and you've just got this set income that hopefully isn't going to fluctuate a ton. Okay, so you are a missionary couple. Let's say that you decide to use some of your salary to get your child private tutoring lessons right? So that they can like SAT college prep type lessons, because you want them to be able to come back to the States and get into a good school. There are going to be some people who are going to be really uppity about that. They're saying, I don't have money to hire an SAT tutor for my kid. So why are you using this donated money for that? And I get that side of it. But on the other hand, like there's an agreement the missionary couple has agreed to serve for the and they have agreed to receive this amount of money so what they do with it is kind of, it, is it any different than somebody who works an office job next door they get this amount of money don't they have the right to do with it when, what they want and i do see both sides but those are some of the things that do make it really tricky yeah definitely <laughs> it definitely does yeah Let's look at verse 21. It says, when it snows, she has no fear for her household, for all of them are clothed in scarlet. And this verse really always jumps out to me. This is one of the verses in Proverbs 31 that does give me warm fuzzies. Like sometimes Proverbs 31 does get my hackles up because I think people have used it to be judgy. But I remember a conversation I had with an, a mom. I had really young kids and she was like, her kids were about to graduate high school and she was kind of a, a friend and a mentor and like her daughter's babysat for our kids. And we were talking about basically prepping, but not using the term prepping, <laughs> but she was talking about how she always tries to have six to eight weeks worth of food just in the pantry so that should something happen, she knows that they're going to be fine for a little bit. And at that point, I had some questions about that because I tried to word the question in a way that wasn't 
trying to sound judgy, but the way I said it was, doesn't God tell us not to worry about what we're going to eat? And doesn't he tell us that the birds don't store away in barns? And so isn't it like in my brain, in my early 20s, I made the leap to say, and therefore, if you are stocking up, doesn't that prove that you're not trusting God to meet your needs? And she pointed me back to this verse. She talked about, we see in Proverbs 31, like the commendable wife is prepared for hurricanes or snowstorms or disasters or something that disrupts your bank account so you don't have as much money to buy groceries one week or things like that. And I really appreciated that because I was wrestling with the sense of, yeah, I want to make sure my kids are protected. I want to be the mom who circles the wagons and make sure that nothing bad comes to my kids, but I also want to prove to God that I'm faithful. And so in my mind, I that was the first time I understood that you could store food away. You could not trust in your stores, right? Like anything could have happened. Someone could have come and robbed it all. A fire could have destroyed it all. So it wasn't, she wasn't saying, I don't need to trust God because I've got this food stored up. So I really appreciated that standpoint. Yeah. It's always funny to me to think back at the at my young self, Mm -hmm. how black and white everything was. Mm -hmm. There just were several instances where, you know, just it, it was like without having certain experiences or thinking through things in a different way, Mm -hmm. just thinking, cause I, yeah. One, so where it talks here about the, when it snows, she has no fear for her household for all of them are clothed in scarlet. I did look to commentary. And one Mm -hmm. of the things that it says is expensive clothing. Scarlet was expensive. It could mean that she's providing high quality clothing for her family. But in context, the word for scarlet can also mean double thickness, which I did not really, and I can't Mm -hmm. back that up other than that this commentary hopefully is accurate, but that would indicate the clothing is warm enough to keep the family warm in the winter, which obviously is only, there are some people that live in places where it never snows, but it's more of a metaphor at that point of what you're talking about, providing for, planning for, and in some ways that means if we're looking at the previous verse about opening your arms to the needy and the poor, it does provide a balance of not only is she generous, but she makes sure that her own are cared for and provided for probably first, even though the other one is listed first. I feel like Mm -hmm. those things are already established so that she has the freedom to look outside. Mm -hmm. And for me, I see that and it means there's a level of planning that takes place and a level of thinking ahead and organization. Mm -hmm. And this is one of those areas where it does sometimes make me feel inferior or give me kind of the, the guilt feeling of, am I prepared for things a lot of times? And this is on a very much lower scale, much less, the stakes are much lower, but just even little things like, like getting pumpkins in October in Anchorage, we would sometimes run out of stuff. And I don't know if that's true everywhere. I I noticed it most, I noticed it a lot in Anchorage though. And Mm. and just that we would run out of things at the holidays. So if you, I remember the first year there, I was a procrastinator. The kids wanted to carve pumpkins and Mm. I went the day before Halloween, I think, and Mm. I wanted to have pumpkins to carve and there were none left. Yeah. They'll just laugh at you. Yeah. I'm like, no, of course there's no pumpkins. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. even things like that, it just makes me think about obviously mm-hmm. pumpkins aren't life and death, but right. I, it just does make me start to think. So that's an area where I find myself needing to take instruction. And I think anytime we're reading these and we feel guilt or shame, We need to discard that, but we need to think, okay, what is it that this is bringing up? Mm -hmm. I absolutely agree. I do a lot of times need to plan better 
And so I think we can, in addition to showing ourselves tons of grace as we read through these, I think there are also some challenges. So for myself, I just, I think that this is one area that I just need to constantly remind myself, you need to plan ahead a little bit because it helps me when I'm planning ahead, it helps my state of mind to Mm. know that I'm that I'm doing that. And I think not only does it help my family, but I like our life better when I plan ahead Mm -hmm. a little bit better. So, And we can bring prayer into that. We can sometimes even, I don't think that this is a cop-out prayer. I think it could be, God, you know how absent-minded I can be about certain things. Help me remember to get the pumpkins when I need to get the pumpkins. Help me how there's that prayer of forgive the sins that I like, forgive my hidden faults, forgive the sins that I don't even know that I'm supposed to confess to you. Yeah. There can even be like, remind me of the things that I don't even remember that I need to be reminded about. And I think that's great for just going to the grocery store. And it's also great for like our prayer list, right? Remind me to pray for the people and the issues that I, that you place on my heart. And then it's less about you just sitting there trying to conjure up that prayer energy, right? I think sometimes about birthing a baby or like gestating a baby. It's hard, it's exhausting, but it's not as though we are sitting in one place mentally focusing on growing a baby. And I think that sometimes, yes, sometimes we need just that discipline, yeah, make that checklist, just do it. (laughs) But other times I think it is more about, I know for me, for writing, I have two options. I can show up at my computer and I can say, I will write today. And I can be like real gritty about it and I can persevere through it. And sometimes that truly is, I feel the calling that God has placed on me for that day, persevere and do it. But a lot of times, and at least in my case, the majority of the time, The work that I do is I create the environment where the inspiration comes. And so I can see that even in our prayers, maybe it's not, oh, I'm so forgetful. I can't believe I'm not praying for all these people and all these missionaries and all these countries. Maybe it's less that and it's more, okay, I know that when I've tidied up the room and I know exactly where my kids need to be and I'm well rested. I know I have more energy to pray about those things. So Mm. maybe your job isn't to slam the door of your prayer closet and grit your teeth and say, I'm going to do this. Maybe your job is to take care of these things. And from that, it's going to be like, naturally the rest is going to flow. I think about today is actually Silas's birthday. And so I'm thinking a lot about his time in the NICU and With his substantive brain injuries at birth, there was a long time where all the doctors could do was basically keep everything in his body functioning to see if his brain could heal itself. They couldn't go into his brain and do anything. All they could do is put him on a ventilator so that he kept breathing and monitor his blood levels so they could make sure all his other organs were working. And I think sometimes that's our job. Like our job might not be to conjure up the prayer energy. Our job might be to create the environment where the prayers flow. And again, I don't want that to let any of us off the hook because I think sometimes we are called to the discipline side of it. And I don't think it's just, oh, I pray when I feel like it. And five months later, you realize you've never talked to God for more than two seconds. So there's that side of it too. But for most people, I'm going to guess, If our listeners were to fall on one extreme or the other, they're going to fall on the extreme of feeling like, why am I so undisciplined? Why am I so unorganized? Why can't I just sit down and do this? And so maybe this will give you listening, just another way to look at it. Okay, take it easy. You're You're going to be okay. (laughs) I love that. Yeah. Yeah. One other kind of facet of this, speaking of prayer, which we are always (laughs) on this podcast, (laughs) is- is if you take the metaphor of preparation for the winter being a spiritual and seasonal figurative season, I feel like she prepares her family for the difficult times spiritually. During the good times, I just picture, I've been thinking about this with our kids, just reminding them when things are good and when things are easier and not 
when just in, in times of plenty in the spring yeah. and summertime of life to cultivate prayer habits in them and remind them to be thankful, to celebrate God's goodness and what he's doing in the good times, but to cultivate like, this is where you go so that when the bad times come, either when you're not as equipped to be mm -hmm. spiritually present or pushing them or they're not, that you can remind th that they're already in, they're already cloaked in prayer yes. at that point mm. so that they can just reflexively revert to yeah. turning to God and thanking him or praying to him or whatever the things are. And I just think that that could be a real kind of, maybe it's a stretch, but metaphorically, I feel like for me as a mom, mm -hmm. I really, I really need that. And especially with a kid far away right now, yeah. I'm just trying for myself. It's important for me during the quote unquote good times when things are, the mm -hmm. prayers are being answered in the way that I want them to be for me to remind myself, okay, now I need to remember this when things don't go my way mm -hmm. to continue giving thanks, to continue to trust in God, to remember those Ebenezer's, I think along the way, that's one of the things is remembering and celebrating and focusing on and re-remembering the big ways that you see God move or the little ways that you see God move in ways that it could only have been him. So that when mm -hmm. you get to the times when he's invisible, when he's silent, when he seems yeah. to be doing the exact opposite of what you want and pray and desperately need for him to do, that you can look back and stand on that and that our kids can too, our families can too. Yeah. I love that picture for all of them are clothed in scarlet and thinking of the scarlet as the prayer covering that we are Ooh, wrapping like them that. around in. And so mm -hmm. I think a really good prayer thought experiment is let's say, heaven forbid, something bad does happen to your child today. Is your initial reaction, oh no, I haven't prayed for them enough. And if so, maybe that is an indication to be covering them more in protective prayers. If you truly do feel this is how I picture the woman. Okay, winter's coming, but I know my family is protected. Mm -hmm. So if you can picture something hard coming to your child, I have prayed over every single contingency and I've prayed like our finite brains can't do that. And so we know, and I've given these blanket prayers, <laughs> God, whatever comes their way, please protect them. If you, that's a huge confidence because then no matter what happens, you are absolutely convinced that nothing can approach them beyond what God has pre-ordained, pre-allowed, and you're never going to have that, oh, should I have prayed more? Could I, you know, could I have foreseen this? So again, I think going back, it started with pumpkins, but that idea of asking God, help me to pray for the things that I don't even know I'm supposed to be praying about. Mm -hmm. I really think that can be a powerful one too. Yeah. Great. I am glad we got to dive into this discussion. Is there anything else that you would like to add? No, I think we pretty well covered it. All righty. We will talk to everybody next time. And thanks so much for joining us.